Robert's Shared Log. It's Wednesday, the 30th of September, recording for Sunday, the 4th of September, 2020. Hello, I'm Robert, and welcome to my shared. Right, I'm sitting on the floor for this because this is the talky bit. I'm going to do some action bit later. This is a piece of wood, a plank of wood specifically, and I've been cutting off lengths to use for my solid desk that I'm building. So this is the angle, but I would normally cut a plank of wood like this out. This is the, th the side of the wood, not the face, the side and the end. And the side is generally what you want to use because you take your saw and you put it on the end and you push it this far and then this bit of the saw has done it some cutting and pushed away all of the dust and you've got another fresh bit of saw to ger generate more sawdust and push that out and so on and so on. Whereas if you do this way, uh, the sawdust just clogs up and you tend to have a much slower cut. Although, I've discovered it's much better to cut it this way. And last week I've been doing delightful work uh, cutting out these pieces here, which you can just about see on screen maybe. Yep, just. Uh, which are basically different lengths of ash. So, the reason that I prefer this way around uh, and it's really very simple, uh, is angling. When you angle the saw, it will cut at an angle. And you don't want that, you want to cut at 90 degrees, you want it square and straight. Because if it's not square, you can't join to it. And you know what? Cutting at a slight angle like that, it's not the end of the world. You can always take a plane and smooth it up later, but I'd rather do a little bit more work sawing, a little less plane. Now at this point, I would normally take this plank because it's only got um, a metre and a bit left and I put it up on top of my desk and I clamp it to the top of the desk and saw, saw it over the edge. That's generally the most comfortable way for me to saw, but I don't, I, I have been using uh, saw horses all week. I want to show you what I've done and how accurate I can get on a saw horse just in the first cut. Bear in mind, you'd, I will need a block plane to tidy up the grain at the end. Hopefully, it'll just be to take the saw marks off and do a little bit of uh, tidy up, not to ruin it. So, first thing I like to do is to clamp down. Okay, I dropped my saw. Okay, first thing I like to do is to clamp down the piece of wood that I'm cutting. And I'm doing this because I don't want it to move when I'm cutting it. You don't need to do this, you can shove it down, but because I'm getting near the end, Especially, I just want to get myself a very firm piece of material. In fact, I'm going to clamp it on the clamp it on the back course as well because it's rising up there. Okay, that should stop everything from moving about too much. Next, is to take a piece of wood. That's the length I want to cut to and mark it. Um, so I'm a bit close to that clamp, so I'm going to clamp it on the other side. Right, so the trick when you're sawing is to only mark, make one mark if you possibly can, because it saves a lot of confusion of where you're cutting. So I'm lining up the back of this piece with the, the plank, and I want to cut a piece that's the same length as this. Now, I don't need to be exact about the length, it can be half a mil either way really, but I don't want it to be the same for all these pieces. So I've done this technique for all of them, I've got the same piece of wood in, in place, my reference piece, I'm just going to mark with a scalpel exact point where that reference piece sits, and that will be the place I start to cut the wood. So, away. That's by the way, that's just one of the pieces of the, uh, the left pedestal that I've already done the frame of. Now, next I need a right angle. Now, I use this tiny three inch set square because, or tri square, because it's beautiful for getting into all sorts of nooks and crannies and measuring right angles exactly. I don't have a big one. This is the one job that a big one would be better. Uh, 
I made the mark, I then need to find it again. This is often a difficulty because I put the reference piece of wood away and the mark just vanishes. There it is. So, the trick to doing this with a tri square is to make sure that the square is pushed up against the wood a little ways away from the mark. Put the scalpel back in the mark and line it up. Now you can use any old knife for measuring, but the thinner the blade is, the better. I like this little craft scalpel because it's quite a thin blade and it will make a mark on the wood that I can see and mark is big enough to register a tool into and not so big that it's um, as bad as a pencil one. Okay, so the next thing I'll need I'm going to use the tri square for that is a steel rule just to extend the mark along the wood. So again, we'll put the scalpel into the mark, bring it up, turn it, put it back into the mark, bring it back, and it should now be lined up, but check it. Make sure the scalpel against the blade fits into that mark exactly. Don't let don't let the thing slide around on you. Then, start at the far end and work back. Because if the steel rule moves, if a straight edge moves, you want to know where the far end is. And so that's important to get that locked in first. Okay, so we run this along. And it's one line all the way along. And finally check that with a set square, make the tri square, make sure it's hitting the other end at a right angle. Because if it isn't, you've already gone wrong. And that is not a right angle. Okay, what's gone wrong? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's first line is not quite right. So I've already, already marked the wood in the wrong place. Do it again. This is me creating a second line on the wood. Oh dear. At least I'll have a correct line to work to. I just need to remember which one is the right line. Oh, that's way off. Go back to the other one. Oh, but that is right. Okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be able to plane off the wrong line when I get there. Usually at this point, I like to mark it with a pencil. So I know which line to cut to, but because I'm going to be working pretty much immediately on this line, I think I'll skip that and just go and deepen that line a bit to make it visible. So for that job, I will need a hammer and chisel. So, chisel has two sides. It has a beveled side and it has a flat side. And you can see that. Hopefully, the, yeah, you want the flat, the bevel side towards the waist and the flat side towards the piece you want to keep. Sorry for just banging the microphone there. So, flat side towards the piece you want to keep, like so. I'm going to start at that end because I can see which line it is. Now this particular chisel has a bit of a nick in it. It's a one inch chisel with a slight dent. I'm just going to put it there and hit it. One hit just makes the line a lot more pronounced and easy to see. And again. I'm not just doing this because of the, the because I've got the marking line wrong. First time this plank, I've got the marking line in the wrong place, but I'm doing it also because I want a reference line I can see with the tool and really get a get a chisel into in a minute. Um, because the biggest problem with sawing into 
the biggest problem with into wood like this is that when you start, because it doesn't progress very much, you you the the saw tends to wander around and scratch the surface, so you really have to be careful how you start off. Which is why it's worth going through the effort of just marking this out. And you could use a combination plane or Um, a, 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 a housing plane, data plane. If you really wanted to get an accurate cut, but that wastes more material and it takes longer. So there we go. We've got the chisel line all the way along, and I want to be cutting on the left side of that chisel line and ignoring any other mark on the wood. That's relatively straightforward, I can remember that. Next thing to do is to turn that chisel line into a groove. So I'm going to move that clamp because it's in the way. I'm just going to clamp the back plane. And I'm going to take this and move it a millimetre from the back at an angle of about 30 degrees, holding it by the blade for safety. So it won't jump out. And just take out a tiny little cut. And that should be just enough to get the saw into. Now this is a slow method of cutting, but it's a slow and accurate method. And I'm commending it. Chisel starting isn't something I do a lot of. Uh, I can usually start a usually start a saw just on, on even on a pencil line, just by starting at the end and then developing starting at the end an angle and then flattening off. But I don't want to do that here because. It's just a lot of extra work. I think I need to sharpen this chisel. Not sharp, but it's taking a while to cut through. Okay, so there we go. So now I've got now I've got the mark on the wood. What I need to do is rest the saw in. Now the point of this next step isn't really to start the cut, it's really to turn that diagonal bevel that I've just cut with the chisel into um, the chisel away, it's, it's cut, turn that into a U-shape that the saw can rest into. And I, I've measured it, with, I've checked it with a set, the tri-square so I know it's straight. I just want to rest the saw in that gap as best I can, keeping the right edge to the line true and gently draw it back, gently and slowly. Using the left hand to hold the saw into place. And that's now sitting reasonably well, so I change my viewing angle to look at the saw blade. I want to get the reflection of this edge in line with this, this edge, um, or, the, or vice versa. If I do that, I know this saw is at 90 degrees to this plate, this wood, and it's a back saw, so I know it's straight, and I've measured it, so I know it's 90 degrees to the end, so everything should be at 90 degrees. It can be a bit tricky because the, uh, you get a bit of an optical illusion on the grain of the wood. 
So. This is a crucial bit. This is why you have to make sure everything is lined up straight. See, I'm going to set now, I will cut up. The back of the saw has a raised handle to my advantage by using the full length of the saw for the first couple of centimetres, first half inch or so, and that will. This gives me a bit more edge per stroke, which means less sawdust and more cutting. Yes, the progression is a lot, lot slower than it was. Uh, going across the grain, but not on the side grain. But I've also got less far to go. So I reckon I can do this in about 10 15 minutes. What I would, would have taken me about 10 minutes anyway to go the other way. And that, that's not like it's a lot of effort. And because it's not cutting very far, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of energy to, to cut with. So it's, it's just moving the hand back and forth. And that's all in the shoulder, so it's... Ah, that's the first, first time today that it's skipped. Uh, just as I was getting confidence in building up speed, it skips out. And this is so so shallow at the moment, it's not even covering the teeth of the saw um, completely. Okay, and since I said that, I'm now about twice as deep as I was then. I'm definitely over the saw teeth and about twice as high as that. So, see, the progression is slow, but it's not, it's not unbearably slow. <laughs> Not deep enough so I can stop worrying about uh, it's keeping it square and it's just going to follow the curve down. Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit close to the bottom of the saw handle now, which means I'm going to stop using the back end of the saw. Uh, but one thing I will point out this end is free to, it's freely open in the air. Uh, so as as this saw cut curve, this cut gets bigger, this side uh, will tend to fall down ever so slightly because this bit of wood will bend ever so slightly, and that's enough to hold these the curve open. As, as that starts straight, and that will fall it's open. It's not just open enough that the saw can just glide down unimpeded by the cut either side. It's, it's not a bad invention, the saw horse. Fortunately, it's really more of a carpenter's tool. It's designed, main advantage is portability, not comfort. I say, I don't like being stupid over like this. I should have my, I should be standing up, upright, my arm at 90 degrees for accuracy. This helps with strength, but there's no way to put more power in than I'm putting in, so strength isn't helping. This is aerobic, not anaerobic exercise. Okay, that's about halfway through. I do have to keep stopping to take breaks every now and then. And I just see a low disk space warning on my computer, so I'm going to sort that out and come back because otherwise the recording will break. So, back in no time at all. Back again. Right, so I got through about half of the wood and I'm just going to do the next quarter or so and then we'll stop and do the next bit. Right, okay, so I've got about 
centimeter. And yeah, we'll just have a quarter of an inch, something like that, on the bottom of the uh, the wood. Now I'm going to stop with this technique at this point because if I keep going, what will happen is because this is free, that now becomes a hindrance because that's putting a lot of pressure on this increasingly thin piece of wood. At some point, I'm going to cut down to the point where it's got just enough strength not to be able to hold this, and it will just snap. To fix that, you want to hold this up while soldering. But if I hold this up, I'm holding it for five minutes. I just can't keep, keep uh, something will go wrong in that time. Can't keep it held up like that. So the, the solution is to switch the saw to an angle and start cutting through here. But it's, which is a lot faster because I'm not then cutting uh, a centimeter worth of wood instead of uh, whatever this is, 32, 33 centimeters. The problem with that is that you'll still get a small piece that will fall off, but it will be here. Which means not only will it uh, want to fall that way and snap, it will also want to fall that way and snap. So you've got to hold it up on both ends. It's far easier if you end up with the last bit in the middle. So that way you have to hold it up, but it doesn't twist to the side. So you cut out half of this side, then I'm going to go around the other side of the, of the sawhorse and cut out this side, uh, ending in the middle, which should be a lot easier. Which also means I'm able to hold the wood in my left hand while cutting with my right, because I'm right-handed. Uh, so let's start off with, I'm going to, this, if I cut a saw, full saw cuff, full saw plate deep, at uh, this angle, this, this 90 degree angle, I'll have cut off about, about half the wood, leaving a little bit left over. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to cut a full saw plate on this side, come round, and cut from the other side to finish off. That was faster. And because of the saw curve, it's at the right angle. So, so on this side, it probably gets, gets me a better angle uh, on screen, for vanity's sake. Now this, this time, I'm not quite sure how much of this I can see because I've got the back to the camera, but I'll have to saw at this angle and I'll have to lay it down lower as I get to the middle, otherwise um, I won't be able to cut the middle bit. Uh, so. holding the wood with my left hand, and I have to hold it up until I finish sawing. I have to keep going, whatever happens, because otherwise it will snap. Whew, that would have been a little bit easier if I'd clamped it there. I was jumping around a bit, but there we go. One end of a piece of wood. And you can see the line there where I finish off. Well, it was that way up, so that's the bottom line where I switch down direction of cut. Um, and I'll need to take that off with the block plane. And I just. I'm not going to finish quality, I just want to cut off the rough bits. Think of myself in dust. The block plane is the only plane that makes dust. And even then, in that end You can't cut end without making dust because. Uh, you're cutting across the fibres. That's why it's called end -grain. Right, there we go, that's basically taken off the saw marks, and now I'm going to check it with the tri square. So, immediately, that is 
not level. There's a little bit of extra on this side. That probably come from the planing. That's dead level. Uh, it's a little bit more on this side as well, so we need a little bit of tidy up. And I reckon that that is as good as you're gonna get. I don't see this. the only egg up I see is a notch that's cut into the the blade just here. This is not here. It's the only gap I see in that. And, and this way. It's a teensy, teensy gap at the end, but very, very small. Uh, oh, put it in the way. Just at the end, there's a tiny gap. But, but again, I've not even got all the saw marks off yet, so that is a pretty decent, decent cut. In fact, I'm not going to take all the saw marks off because I want to do that after joining it. So there we go. Uh, I don't know quite how long that was, but no, I know I spent uh, 20 minutes in the first video, which first 15 were just talking. So, oh, well, first, no, sorry, first 10. 25 minutes of the first, first 10 were just talking, 15 minutes soaring. Second one, probably about 5 or 10 minutes soaring after that. So, yeah, 20, 25 minutes to cut a joint, which is a long time. You could use a power saw and do it in 30 seconds. But that is smooth enough to work with. I can smooth it down further very easily. And it's dead on the square without using power tools. And that, I think. If that, yeah, I'm happy with that. I can use it. Um, and so yeah, tune in next week on Shedlog for more shed related stuff. I might do some talk about audio, maybe speakers and stuff. But that's all for Shedlog this week. Ta ta. Robert Shedlock, it's Wednesday the 30th of September, 30th. <laughs>